Welcome back to the Fancy Network, everyone. My name is, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and we're going to be talking about everything I read in February. Did the three-star play continue? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I mean, except for one exception, a lot of stuff in this month was not my favorite. But I did have some reads that I think, even if they weren't outstanding for me, were solid. And I think some of you need to check out this one series that I'm going to talk about because I'm surprised I don't see more people talking about it. Don't tell me you reread Game of Thrones. No, it's not A Song of Ice and Fire, Bobby. I think everyone knows how I feel about that series. We will also be doing the Patreon pick for March and seeing what random book my patron will be selecting for me. Uh, always look forward to that. And this month was largely, again, about continuing some series uh, and then also finishing some series and starting a series, actually. So I guess I'm kind of all over the place per usual. But let's begin with the one series that I did end up finishing here in the month of February, which is a trilogy by Richard Swan. The third book, Trials of Empire, you have to say the covers for this series, in my opinion, are fantastic. I was positive on book one, thought there was a decent amount of promise to the series, but I wanted to see more. And book two ended up being a little bit worse than book one for me, but still not offensively bad by any means, just maybe a bit disappointing. And then I went into book three just wanting to see what happens? What happens with this ending? Uh, we're following justices from the Empire. This Empire is in turmoil, to say the least. And there's a bunch of religious themes explored here, but also a lot of eldritch horror, which I really, really like. Uh, there are some scenes in this third book that kind of blew me away, to be honest with you, with just how horrifying they actually were and intense. There were times where I felt like the Dark Souls aesthetic, which I'm a massive fan of all the FromSoft games, uh, felt like it was very present here. I would be curious if Richard Swan likes those games because some of those scenes felt very close uh, to that, or at least in the same realm. That's where this book shines, and I think I said this about book two, is in the horror aspects. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily think the, the melding of the justice arc, the religious arc, and then the horror arc, arc all kind of like coincided super well. I don't think it melded super well. So that is where the story, I think, struggles a little bit for me. I don't know if the story felt like it was going in this direction and I'm okay with a little bit of a twist uh, here and there or, you know, kind of ramping up of things in the final book. But I wish maybe there would have been a little bit more drip of the horror stuff earlier on. It wasn't not there. It just wasn't a ton. And in this third book, it is absolutely present. Uh, this book was surprisingly full throttle the entire way through. I kept thinking, oh my God, there's still 300 pages left. Like, how is he going to finish this up? We're doing so much, like so much happens in this book. A piece of the climax was a little too quick, but overall I thought the pacing of the book was actually quite enjoyable and very readable. And when it comes to the very end of the book, like the end of this trilogy, how I feel about it, I feel very good. And I like the ending that he went with, especially one of the scenes is really great. So overall, I am positive on Empire of the Wolf. I don't think it's going to be a favorite. Will I think about it in 10 years from now? I don't know, probably not. If there's anything I will remember, it'll be all of the horror aspects. But I'm really more excited to see what Richard Swan does next. And I am happy that I read this trilogy. I think that he's an author that has a lot of promise. And there's stuff here that you could enjoy. Um, it just has a couple blemishes, in my opinion. Next is a book that was continuing in a series, and that is Mistborn Era 2, Bands of Mourning. Um, the Bands of Mourning. I, I, I didn't like this book very much. Uh, it just continued to have the same issues I've had with the previous two books. Uh, a lot of promise at the beginning of it, and I was kind of intrigued by more of the lore that's coming in here because I do love the Mistborn magic uh, and, you know, just how things are progressing in this world. It's kind of interesting, but it felt like every single time we were getting to a point where I was saying, okay, I'm in, it would be just stifled by some comedic relief from Wayne that I just don't mesh with. And I've had people tell me that Wayne gets better as the series goes on, but I feel like I'm just getting more and more annoyed as he goes. I know there's more context for his backstory. I just don't seem to care. And I don't like any of these characters at all, which sucks. Uh, I kind of paused. I was going to try to get Lost Metal in this month, but after just feeling super underwhelmed and slogging through the finish of this book, uh, I feel as if the Lost Metal... Might be a lost cause. Maybe not, though, because people say that The Lost Metal is a departure from the first three, and a lot of people were upset that it didn't focus as much on the story that had come before, and there's a bunch of Cosmere stuff. So maybe The Lost Metal will actually work for me, because at this point, I'm pretty out uh, on Mistborn Era 2. I'm not going to go on and on and on, because, like I've said in my last video, it's a bit exhausting talking about these books. But I can only boil it down to the fact that I just don't feel invested 
at all. This next one is starting a series, uh, but this is a Patreon pick. So I actually didn't choose this. I would have never chosen this, to be honest with you. Uh, and that is The Waking Fire by Anthony Ryan, which is book one in the Draconis Memoria, I believe. And Anthony Ryan is an author where I have read The Pariah. I thought it was really well written, and it just didn't do a bunch for me. Uh, Anthony Ryan is extraordinarily intelligent, and you can tell that in the way that he writes. He's very meticulous in details uh, and just seems like he has a lot of knowledge, especially in Pariah with a bunch of the more medieval stuff. I think he has a Ph.D. in medieval medieval history i might be wrong about that the bottom line is i think anthony ryan's a talented writer who could probably tell a great story probably just wasn't for me i think it's probably a really good book so the waking fire is his second chance uh to kind of click with me and i have to say even though this is not an outstanding overwhelming go out and buy it i am shocked by just how few people i know that have read this series and have tried this book one I like quite a bit of this. I just talked about how Mistborn Air 2 wasn't really working for me, but I love the Mistborn magic and the implications that it has on the world that the characters are inhabiting, uh, inhabiting, inhabiting. The Waking Fire has magic that is a bit similar to Mistborn in the fact that you're going to ingest something and then it's going to grant you some sort of magical powers. This just so happens to come from different types of dragons or drakes in the book, and the different colored drakes, once you ingest their blood, grant you different powers. This is already super duper interesting and has a little bit more flair than something like the Pariah had that was a little bit more grounded. Uh, also seeing people say, you know, this is kind of Victorian area steampunk. I would agree with that. There's a bit of steampunk here, but not an excessive amount because it's not my favorite aesthetic in the world. It never bothered me really at all. Uh, and then I did think all of the Drake stuff was super duper interesting. So you get multiple POVs in this book. One is from a spy who's also an assassin and she's working for this corporation that has a huge hand in the world and she is just awesome. Uh, Lizanne, she is my favorite POV in the book. Uh, her journey goes in uh, trying to gather information, gather intel, and she, she's on a mission is basically all I can say without spoiling anything. I just thought her balance of being someone that is extraordinarily dangerous and deadly but also still having a conscious and having to mull over moral decisions was actually really well done. And I love this character. I thought she was fantastic. Where she ends up in the end of the story, I'm not super keen on. I think that it kind of teetered at the end for me, but it's not something where it ruined everything that came prior. And it wasn't bad. It just, you know, I would have liked to seen maybe something a little bit different. Then you have like this down low scoundrel character and he has the ability to ingest Drake blood and, and he's blessed with that. Um, and, he is coming from a very different walk of life than a lot of the other elites or the other POVs. And he goes through a very traumatic uh, event towards the beginning of the book. And that kind of catapults him into uh, the bigger picture, you know, a lonely scoundrel with just a little bit of talent that is being used for that talent. Uh, again, kind of against his will uh, and has a messy family history, it seems. This character was not my favorite. I think that it falls into a, something that a lot of fantasy does, which is like, Here's this really impactful thing. It affects them for a couple pages. And then after that, it never really feels like it informs their their maneuvers in the world or their decisions. I felt that way. I, I would hear an argument against that for sure. And it's not that this character was bad. I actually think the character was pretty good, uh, but just was not my favorite. And I think that there was more to gain from the setup for this character that we just never saw pay off. I realize I never said the character's name. His name's Clay, uh, which... It's fine. It's an okay name. The third POV is Hillmore, a Heilmore, and he is in the military. He's on this naval ship. They're going after pirates. He has seen a lot of battles, and he's seen a lot of bad things. Uh, has a bit of a mysterious past. You're not really sure exactly what's going on there. Uh, obviously, a relationship has been kind of splintered, but we're waiting for more information with this. This was awesome. The naval stuff in this book, there's a lot of naval uh, maneuvering, warfare, all of that. And even though that's not something I gravitate towards, I don't necessarily dislike it, but it's not something I'm dying to see every single time. This may be some of my favorite naval stuff that I have read. There is a uh, battle scene that I found to be just gripping the entire way through and had one of my favorite tropes that you can have in battle. And I'll let you kind of uh, experience that if you're going to read this book. Th this book is 600 pages, okay? And I think for its size, it does quite a lot. Where it didn't do so much for me is in the middle. It felt like it dragged its belly a lot. It didn't feel like the characters had their own distinction and voice 
which really kind of bothered me. They're in very different walks of life. And while there is subtle differences in the way that they talk, talk and think, I think it could have been flexed a whole lot more. And that would have made this an absolute standout where I would come in here screaming that you need to read this. But for everything I just said, you know, Mistborn, Victorian era, steampunk dragons, I've heard people use those, you know, those words to kind of pitch this. I'm surprised more people haven't picked this up. The back of the book says The Waking Fire is part Indiana Jones, part Pirates of the Caribbean, and part Mistborn. It's got wonderful, memorable characters and great action. I loved it. I don't know if I would say it has the most wonderful, memorable characters, but it has solid characters and it does have great action and it has a lot of intrigue. There's patents in these worlds, uh, people trying to invent this engine and get blueprints from this and family history of who owns these things and who actually did it to mysterious adventurers that have gone missing and a mystical white drake that may or may not be myth. Like there's a lot of stuff that he sets up in this book, one that's great. So even though I'm, you know, I, I would say I'm mostly positive on this book. I, I really think a lot of you would like this and I hope someone else would try it out. This feels like one of those things where like book one's a three, three and a half star, but the ceiling is very high for book two and three to do something awesome to make this a standout series. So I will continue this. I don't know when I'll get to book two, but I do think that this is one I would like to continue uh, for sure. Side note, I tried the audiobook. I didn't like the audiobook narrator at all. I felt like he made the story very dry and mundane and just bleh. Can't did not like the audiobook narration at all. So uh, for me, you know, I recommend reading this. I think uh, with your eyeballs, if you will, um, and maybe you'll give it a shot, and maybe you'll love it. If you fin finish this series, and you know, I mean, don't spoil me, but like, does it get better from here? Because if it does, you know, like I said, I see the ceiling being really high for this, and I don't think the basement could go very low. I think Anthony Ryan's just fairly competent writer. Um, I will throw in one last note that I'm kind of rambling about this book. I feel very conflicted about this book. I thought about doing a full review for it actually at one point just to kind of highlight it and see if other people have opinions on it. But there's something about Anthony Ryan's writing where I just am always kind of put off by it. And it's not because he's a bad writer. He's actually very talented. Almost always. He uses like a six letter word when a three letter word will do. Does that make sense? Uh, and maybe that's just because he's so smart. But there are just times where it feels a little rigid and a little too proper for me. And maybe that's just because I'm dumb, probably. But it's not like you need a thesaurus to read this book. It's not It's not to that level. I don't know. There's just something about his prose that makes me feel off-putting, off-put. I don't know. If it, Does anyone know what I mean? Probably not. I'm, I'm probably rambling. I'm sorry. But uh, this book is pretty good. And then the book that stood out, and this is definitely the book of the month for me, is The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, I probably said that name wrong, and I'm so sorry if I did. Uh, this is about an undercover Nazi assassin posing as a butler in post-World War II Europe that is trying to topple the empire. I'm kidding. It's not at all about any of that. It's about a butler that takes a couple days off. Five stars. I loved it. I, I, <laughs> listen, this is the grandma book of the month. I read this book. I put it down. I haven't stopped thinking about it. I've talked about it to multiple people who haven't even read it. I talked about people like bothering people with jujitsu, like, hey. You got to hear about this book. Um, so this author has won uh, the Booker Prize and the Nobel Prize of Literature. So, you know, definitely has get, been given his flowers. And I see why. Because this book to me is just so approachable and well-written. And for something that is consistently looked upon as a fine piece of literature, it, it doesn't have any pretentiousness uh, in its approach. With that said, it is about a butler. And I'll be damned if this author <laughs> wasn't a butler in England in post-World War II. I mean, he makes you really feel like you were there and you were experiencing what a butler is like. And I, things I love about this book is that it really takes time to try to identify what makes a great butler. And at the core of that is dignity. And as World War II comes to an end and you know, there's a retrospective and we look back at everything that's happened, I think that dignity maybe changed in definition in some people's minds. And this is something that the butler is having to tackle. And his entire life, his father was a butler, and he wanted to embody that. And just watching this person dedicated to their craft and their career and missing out on a lot of life's experiences is just heart-wrenching. It's also somewhat admirable to see someone so dedicated to the craft 
like I can kind of understand that because I have an obsessive personality and I get obsessed with things and I laser in and other things suffer and it's been a strength and a weakness for me in my life. So I felt like I could kind of relate with that. But you're, you're seeing this person take time away from their job for just a few days, a drive to the countryside, reuniting with someone they used to work at, at the house. And in that break, I think he begins to kind of see some of the cracks uh, in this person that he thought was just amazing and infallible and smart and genius and good natured. And uh, yeah, I don't know how to really make this sound amazing to you. I just know that it is for me. And I love this book. I love books that can put me in the shoes of another person, another place, another time and another profession or whatever and make it. Yeah, I got lost. I got lost in this book. I was so immersed. Uh, it reminds me a lot of ways of stoner by John Williams. But whereas I think Stoner is endorsing the idea of taking a job and just being good at that is like enough. I think that this book is actually maybe pushing back on that idea, maybe just a little bit. And maybe I'm seeing it wrong, possibly. Maybe these two books shouldn't even be compared. But I I don't know. I love this book. If you like literary fiction and you want to know what it's like to be a butler post-World War II, this might be the one for you. Uh, the voice is so strong. It is actually very humorous at times while also being heart wrenching. And one of the things I loved about this is, you know, this is a Butler writing to you. So it's in the first person perspective, retrospective. And it's like, you can see him going through cognitive dissonance and like what he is trying to hide from himself and argue with himself about and what he won't admit to himself. And it's just really powerful. So this book moved me. I loved it. Jared recommended this to me, Jared Henderson. So I got to say shouts out to him. I know a lot of people like never let me go, but he said to start with this and then go to that one. So I will definitely be reading more uh, of this author. And it's just outstanding. Once again, gets the nut button, which, you know, is hilarious considering this won the Nobel Peace Prize or not the, the Nobel Prize of literature, not peace. Uh, but yeah, for me, this is definitely already in a candidate of top 10 books of the year, which uh, this year has been not the best so far. It's Patreon pick time. These are books selected by the members of my Patreon who are in the Knights Watching Kingsguard tiers, so the top two tiers. But I want to give a shout out to all my patrons for supporting it, even if you're just watching this video. Thank you so much. Let's see what the random book is going to be for the month of March. Uh, March is looking to be maybe the best month so far in this year, which isn't that high of a bar. <laughs> it's been a pretty mediocre year reading-wise so far. But let, let's try to turn it around and see what my patrons have in store for me. All right, we shook him up there. And the winner is, for March, the Patreon pick of the month is number 69, uh, which is our boy Kev, and the book is A Little Life. And I don't know the author's name. The only thing I know is that this book uh, is lauded as extraordinarily sad. That's the only thing I really know about this book. And then I do know there are some people who absolutely hate this book <laughs> with a burning patch. Seems like one on the internet that a lot of people have read and have a lot of opinions about. So I guess I'll be adding my opinion to the mix. Kev, congratulations. And I'm excited to read a little life. Is this book super duper long? I'm not sure. Okay, so it looks like it's like 720 pages. So, I mean, it's a decently long book. Something about four classmates by Hanya Yanagihara. I, I, if I said that wrong, I'm sorry. This book has almost 600,000 ratings on Goodreads with a 4.34. I mean, Goodreads doesn't mean a lot because, like, they give my favorite books three stars, but that's a lot of ratings. I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. So the thing about reading a popular book is that there's always a lot of material resources and reviews for it, and sometimes it's fun to just kind of see what other people think, and I think that this is going to be one of those cases. Now, for the rest of March, I, I usually don't go super in-depth on my TBR, but I am going to be finishing up In Ascension by Martin McKinnis, I believe is his name. Uh, this was long listed for the Booker Prize. It's a first cat contact sci-fi book uh, about an oceanographer and just... A really slow, methodical book that is very tied to the POV, and the sci-fi stuff is almost like kind of sprinkled in there. So it, I would say it's more literary fiction first. Uh, I'm about halfway, or a little more halfway through it already. I I'm loving it. I'm really, really loving it. I'm also gonna be reading *Sailing to Serantium* by Guy Gavriel K. I've only read the first like 20 pages of this book, but oh my god, it's so good to be back with GGK already. Uh, and hopefully I can do Laura Emper's the following month, which is the sequel in the Serantine Mosaic. Oh yeah, I might read Children of Dune. And then I also started Cloud Atlas. I also started Gideon the Ninth. 
And I also started The Great Code. So I got to figure out what I'm actually reading. I said a lot of those books. That doesn't mean they're all going to be read in March or even be read soon. But those are books that I'm interested in right now and ones that I'd like to get to. I just saw Dune 2, so obviously the Dune hype is is affecting me, and I want to continue to be uh, on Arrakis or Dune, and uh, maybe Children of Dune will be something that I will complete. I've read about 50 pages of it, and it is a slammer so far. Uh, Frank Herbert, there's really nobody else like him, honestly. He's, he's something else, <laughs> to say the least. What did you read in the month of February? Let me know down below. What are you reading in March? And did you go see Dune 2? Did you like it? I loved it. I thought it was great, but I also have terrible taste in movies, so what do I really know? Uh, but, hey, let's say that March is going to be our best reading month of the year so far, huh? Let's cross our fingers and hope so. Uh, if you end up liking this, you can hit like. If you dislike, hit dislike. If you love the thing about subscribing, there is a Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciated. Until I see you next time, be good, be safe, and remember to always keep turning the page. I want to give a big shout out to all my patrons, including my high tier patrons, my King's Guard, which is Bridger, Zan, Adam K, Emil, Curtis L, Jonathan J, Prithi, Eric B, Chadia, Steve Talks Books, Taylor D, Matthias D, Carlos, Yolanda, Amanda L, John C, John, Garrick, Evie, Henrik, Benjamin C, Sebastian M, Frank C, C. Scott, Jacob Wade, Darren, Jobot, Terrence F, Michael B, Lauren M, Nicholas E, Kai, Kev, Ryan, Jay, Shad, Amanda V, Ikaika, RJ, Stewart, Oscar, Derry, Tanner, Stromboli Bones, Damon H, and Robert M, Bass, and Kuiper. Thank you all so much. You're the best.